Exciting time for dividend investors. There are new dividend payers in town. Hello investors, bonjour. This is Mike Yeru, founder of Dividend Stocks Rocks and passionate investor. You're listening to the Dividend Guy Blog podcast where I and my co-host Veronique will help you invest with more conviction so you can enjoy your retirement. Dividend Growth Investors, bonjour, Mike Yeru here. You're listening to the Dividend Guy podcast. I hope you are doing well. I am with my co-host, Véronique, today, and we are going to talk about some new companies on the show. How exciting is this, right, Mike? Uh, but, you know, last week we talked about telecoms and how the media businesses and wireline companies are now part of a dying industry. We have to face it. And in the meantime, like you said, some companies have been around for a couple of decades and now pay dividends. Some of them are in the communication services sector, others in the, the information technologies. But still, I wondered, with all, all that in mind, are these companies like the, the future telecoms, if we can name it that way, and how they will change the communication services landscape for investors. So let's look into that with Meta, Google, and Salesforce. Yeah, it's a, it's very interesting how things change over the course of the time, but they don't change that much. Uh, it's it's like I, I did that parallel a while ago with semiconductors, for example, becoming mm -hmm. kind of like the new industrials that that rose in like the 60s and the 70s in a sense where now semiconductors are cyclical they go with backlogs they work with like other companies they're affected by the economy in general so when there's like a lot of demands or not uh we also the uh the chain supply disruption how it affected those companies and it would have been quite similar to what would have happened in the industrial sectors like 50 years ago mm -hmm. today as you said uh we we covered telecoms last week <laughs> was not pretty <laughs> and and on the other side today internet players like meta and and alphabet are, are kind of like the new way of communicating they are the new way of entertaining people and and we can see that kind of like switch where the telecoms are slowing down. It's becoming a little bit harder for them to be exciting and to find growth victors. While mm -hmm. the companies that we're going to talk about today, they're growing high single double digit on pretty much every single metrics, which is quite surprising. And it's about time they all decided to reward shareholders with <laughs> dividend payments. And uh, by the way, listeners, if you're new to the show, uh, every time we mention uh, an, an older previous episode or like a resource or whatever, I always put it in the show notes so you can visit the dividendguyblog.com slash 192. And also you should not consider the stocks mentioned in this episode as buyer or sell recommendations. You must always do your due diligence. Mike, before we dive into the impact of these new dividend payers, let's discuss their business model. Of course, we all know Meta because of Facebook and Instagram, but how would you describe it from a business point of view? Yeah, so without any surprises, it's the world's largest online social network with almost 4 billion monthly active users. It's just mind-blowing to imagine that the mm -hmm. entire planet is on their phone Pretty using <laughs> either either Facebook, either Instagram, um, and and most of the revenue for Meta is um, is coming from advertising sources. And I was like, I was intrigued by looking to the business model. And I thought, yes, they're making money with advertisement, but it, it, are there any other sources at this point? Mm -hmm. Pretty much 90% of the revenue are coming from this. So we can really say it's a pure play on advertising and marketing. Uh, about like 40 to 45, 40 to 45% of Meta's revenue is coming from North America. So while we may think that the entire planet is using it. The, the bulk of the money is still coming from Canada, Mexico, and of course, the United States by a wide margin. Mm -hmm. uh, Meta is the operator of Facebook, Instagram, Messenger, Treads, WhatsApp, and others. Uh, but really, it all comes down to just a marketing business, which is kind of like surprising on one sense. Uh, but having this huge network effect that we're going to talk later on today in the investment thesis it 
it's just like a, a, a perfect flywheel where more users attracts more money, which attracts more users and then it goes mm-hmm. on and on and on, um, which, which is kind of like perfect to have a business model that that could eventually pay a dividend because they can count on that kind of like recurring revenue. Mm-hmm. And just, uh, I'm tempted to add like a parallel here, uh, Facebook, uh, not face, Facebook, but Meta, like you said, generate most of its revenue from ads, just like media businesses used to, right? So yeah. <laughs> just, just a quick note here. So Mike, when we say Google, I immediately see the search engine box. Like this is pretty much what it's all about for most users, but there's a lot more to Alphabet, the real name, right? So what is its business model? It, it's kind of ironic because those two companies have like like Meta and Alphabet. They have such strong brand names under the umbrella, which is Facebook and and Google, that we tend to call them by like one of their like of course biggest part of their business. But Alphabet is really a holding company, so it owns a lot of different brands. But of course, Google is definitely the big <laughs> player here. But they are also YouTube. They are they have the Play Store, which you have like all the um, the in-app purchase that you can make with your mobile phone. Uh, Chromebooks, Pixel smartphones as well. They have cloud services. Um, and they also invest in a lot of upcoming technologies such as self-driving cars with Waymo, Health ver- with ver- Verily, and internet access with Google Fiber. When you look at their income statements, 75% uh, of the revenue comes from Google ads, roughly. Uh, mm-hmm. 11% comes from subscriptions. And another 11% comes from cloud. So even though the cloud business could be a business by itself, generating like like in 2020, for the full year of 2023, uh, it generated above $33 billion in revenue. So you can think that, well, that alone is a huge mm-hmm. business. But when you think that Google generated almost 310 billion in revenue in 23. It doesn't crazy. sound like it's a big part. Yeah, I know it's kind of crazy. But those businesses are so big that they own several other smaller businesses. But really the the engine behind Alphabet remains Google, the Google network. Now, Salesforce is the one I know less about. It's also part of the information technology sector. What makes it different from the other two regarding its business model? Yeah, that would have been fun to just focus on on the communication sectors today, but I couldn't have not ignored Salesforce starting to pay a dividend. Um, mm-hmm. You may not know this company, but you will surely remember Open Text, which we covered from time to time right. on the on the show. Um, so it is. Like not exactly the same type of business because it's a lot bigger, uh, but it is offering similar services. So Salesforce is uh, one of the largest, if not the largest CRM operator. So customer mm-hmm. relationship management software. It's a SaaS, so a software as a business. It offers like multiple services on multiple platforms. So they have like their CRMs, they offer cloud services, they go into uh, e-commerce as well. They, they have this ability similar to open text, but on, on a larger scale to make acquisition to grow. Uh, and, and what is great about this type of businesses is they generate like very sticky relationship with their clients because it takes a while to select the CRM you want to operate in your business. And once you do, well, you don't want to shift because there's a huge learning curves. You have to invest a lot of money. And, mm-hmm. and usually you're going to just stick to what you have and, and make it work. On the other side, by growing their portfolio of clients and also their services, that opens the door to a lot of cross-selling opportunities. And again, this one operating with mostly recurring revenues, again, creating the perfect environment for a business to start paying a dividend. Okay, Mike, do you think Meta and Alphabet business models impact the communication sector? In other words, Are they the proof of a shift in this sector? Because like you've mentioned in the introduction, it reminds me a bit of our economy's significant transition from like manufacturers and big industries to companies that offer services and products. So are we witnessing a similar change? 
Uh, definitely. It's kind of ironic because uh, before we started recording this uh, this this show, uh, we were discussing Vero and I about like the new generation and the fire <laughs> movement and the fact that like the like a lot of people these days wants to work a little bit less and enjoy a little bit more time and and just do whatever they like and and that that is kind of like a link where we like to be entertained and and the money that is being spent on advertising of course will follow where our eyeballs are so if we don't watch tv anymore well and we spend more time on our phones or on the internet well this is where the money is going to go so as you mentioned earlier while the media the big medias used to get a lot of money from the advertisement budget of companies mm -hmm. well now that money is literally going towards uh facebook and google of this world because this is where people spend most of their time so they're not watching the cable anymore but they do like watch reels and they search uh, like they search for for a lot of things on the internet and this is how like companies are able to be found today so their their whole business is about this network effect where the more user you have the more content you will they will produce or for google the more the uh, the company will have data on what is being searched and the experience mm -hmm. of the user and based on that information well they will improve the experience they will provide more content and of course it will drive more dollars that will help them to actually attract more customers and so on. So the more users users you have, the better the experience will be and the better the experience will be, well, the more money you're gonna make and the more money you're gonna make, well, the more you're gonna invest in your platform and the more you're going to attract users, <laughs> which is like the perfect flywheel. It's just, I'm talking about it and I'm like, wow, that's this very exciting business models that we see here and, and both uh, Facebook and, and Google have like driven billions of dollars away from traditional media. Right. And the big question follows. Meta, Alphabet and Salesforce were healthy businesses making profits and seen like as the big guys, you know. So why did they start paying a dividend? What does it change for them? That's a very interesting question, because when you look from a metrics perspective, if we use the dividend triangle, the first two legs are pretty strong. So when you look at the revenue and the earnings, you're thinking, well, those businesses are growing fast and they're making a lot of profit. And that leads to the basic of like why a company pays a dividend in the first place. Well, technically, the a company that pays a dividend is because they have so much money they don't know what to do with it. And since they cannot invest in new growth vectors, they might as well just send that money back to shareholders and let them allocate that money elsewhere. So that's the very, very first reason why we should, why a company should pay a dividend is just if you cannot add more value by investing in your business, let investors use that money elsewhere. When you look at Meta and Alphabet, they're very far from being done by creating more growth vectors. Actually, mm -hmm. they are investing massively to find other solutions, to make acquisitions, to develop new products. So you may be thinking, well, they can Why? use all <laughs> their money literally to generate growth vectors. And mm -hmm. at this stage, the thing is, they probably don't know how to deploy all that money upfront so they can afford to share some of that cash flow because they know that the next quarter they're still going to have like a ton of new cash flow coming in. So they still dispose of a part of that money because there's always a risk when you make a lot of money to just destroy that value as well. So instead of like going too fast all the time, it's more about selecting opportunities for them. And mm -hmm. in the meantime, since they cannot probably grow as fast as they would like to because they would just drop the ball somewhere and it would just destroy cash flow, they better off to pay that dividend to someone else. Um, it's also probably to attract a little bit more of investors to keep the hype going because now you're getting a new crowd that is interested by dividend, just like me, for example, uh, that could actually consider now Meta or Alphabet because that was like a big discussion for a long time, even at DSR. Like members were asking, well, why do you not follow those big companies? And I'm like, yeah, well, I have to narrow down my research and focus on what I really like. And we're going to discuss a little bit more about like what it 
what it gives us as an investor that a company pays a dividend. But mm -hmm. I cannot just like follow 10,000 companies. That just doesn't make any sense. And that's why we have to narrow down our choices. And, and it's not necessarily that dividend growth investing is perfect, but it's a way to narrow it down. Um, paying a dividend for a business is also kind of like a strange relationship with shareholders. Uh, on the other side, BCE that we have discussed earlier um, this month on this on the show is stuck with its dividend policy. I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure that if nobody knew that BCE was paying a dividend and it was just for like management to receive that that dividends or like a few shareholders that are like not a public business, they would probably have cut it a long time ago. But now they're stuck with that image that they're reflecting to the market and not increasing your dividend or cutting it off would send a terrible message. And of course, it, that would make some investors run away. Mm -hmm. um, as for CRM, the, the situation is a bit different. Uh, they have been growing very fast, but the growth is likely to slow down. So they grow by acquisition, they grow organically, uh, but chances are that they're they're not going to be able to replicate the past five years of growth. So yes, it's going to continue to be a thriving business, but maybe a little bit less. So it's a good moment for them to focus on margin improvement, focus on buying back shares and growing their dividend so they can entertain investors, get, like, get them to stick around for a little bit longer, and maybe like just becoming a, a more mature businesses that will continue to generate that constant cash flow coming from the, the, the subscription business model that they have created. Mm -hmm. Hey, dividend growth investors, this is Vero. Mike is currently taking a sip of water, which gives us 10 seconds. And I literally mean 10 seconds to grow the podcast together. Go on Spotify or Apple podcast, hit pause, and then under our logo, you'll see two very interesting buttons. One to subscribe, hit that subscribe button now, and then give us a five-star rating. You know, our goal is to help more investors just like you. So please spread the love. Thank you. So what does it mean for investors? Well, first and foremost, we're going to cover them at DSR, which is pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, jokes aside, what I like as an investor, when a business starts paying a company, uh, paying a dividend, is it brings a whole new set of metrics, and this is mm -hmm. what I like about it. Is now I have more information to analyze a business because I can analyze the dividend trend. Uh, of course, now they started to pay dividend in 24, so there's no trend to analyze there. But mm -hmm. in a few years from now, we're going to see what's the dividend growth policy. Are they going to go for like a mid single digit or double digit and become very generous with their dividend? increases uh, that will be interesting to follow we'll have also a better idea of like the payout ratio the yield average and it will like the yield average will also help us to determine if the company is overpriced or not of course mm -hmm. we need a few years for that but those are like all new metrics that we didn't have yesterday that we have now that makes it easier to monitor and to analyze and determine if google uh meta or Salesforce should be part of our of our portfolio. And and going back to why companies start paying a dividend, well, usually you have a very great business model. We just discussed that. And the three companies definitely have a lot to offer to the market. They are thriving companies and they generate lots of cash flow. So for the dividend initiators, they're always exciting businesses because they mm -hmm. should be starting to pay a dividend at their prime. So now the real question is to go deeper into the analysis and try to determine, are those companies are going to continue to thrive in the future? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's discuss those trends, Mike, because you know we know that you focus on five-year trends, the dividend triangle, to start your stock research. Do Meta, Google, and Salesforce still show a strong investment thesis to you despite the fact that some trends are missing? <laughs> yeah, well, um, I've done that in the past with Constellation Software where they literally forgot to take the dividend off from their, their board meeting. So they're paying like a dollar and the, the stock trades above $4,000 buck as $4,000. So I don't even know what it makes as a dividend yield, but it's just ridiculous and it doesn't increase the <laughs> dividend. However, when you look at the revenue, the cash flow from operation, the earnings, everything is going up. 
which is crazy. So chances are those three companies will become low yield, high dividend growth companies, which are, in my opinion, the most exciting businesses. Mm -hmm. So let's start with the investment thesis for Meta. Well, as I mentioned earlier, there's an infinite flywheel of content here. I mean, more users, more content, more advertisers, and then you just spin that wheel over and over and over until, I mean, you just get tired of spinning it because there's like nothing to slow it down at this point. <laughs> um, they're, but they know that it's not enough. So they're developing also a, a, a great app of ecosystem. And I know that your husband is a big fan of Marketplace. <laughs> a lot of people, I mean, it helps to, to tie up people on their phone even more. So they're just not yes. saying, Okay, so I'm done with like the ridiculous stuff that I see on Reels and I'm done with like just looking at what my family and friends are doing, but let me shop around for like a, a new couch or whatever that I can find interesting on Marketplace. Uh, they do spend a ridiculous amount of CapEx year after year to improve the platform, find new growth vectors and find just more ways to keep those users on board because they are well aware that their entire business model depends on that flywheel, but they have done an amazing job there. And you can see that both uh, Meta and Google, they will benefit from a, a that big moat. Uh, we did an... Um, we did an episode on on like the Modi businesses and definitely mm -hmm. those two companies, they, uh, they have built something incredible. As for Alphabet, I mean, Google's position in search engine is just ridiculous. It is so ridiculous that now it's attracting regulators for uh, and they're, they're, they're challenging the, uh, the monopoly that, uh, that Google has, has built around the fact that now they're present on all computers, on all mobiles, and, and basically it's virtually impossible to not use Google. I mean, unless you actively try not to, but by reflex, or whenever you're trying to search for something, you're going to get there. So mm -hmm. by having this huge monopoly, literally, and that incredible network effect, it just creates a never-ending cash flow machine. And they use that money to fuel other projects. So I see a big similarity with between Google and Apple where for a long time they were like Apple was relying almost solely on their iPhone sales to generate that much cash flow and then expand into new products. So it's a similar way for Alphabet to say, oh, you know what? We're making so much money with Google advertisement. Now they've built Google Cloud services, which works very well, growing double digit quarter after quarter, um, becoming its own business within the business, which is great. And, mm -hmm. and they have like several other great and interesting projects going forward. So similar to Meta, it is investing massively to make sure that the, it remains relevant. Mm -hmm. As for Salesforce, what I like the most about that business model is the cross-selling opportunities. So on one side, you have a wide variety of products they, are, they already offer, and they, they grow organically, but also through acquisitions. So whenever they acquire a new business, they acquire two things. First, they acquire a book of new clients so they can sell their existing products to those new clients. And then they acquire as well another software or another technology that they can actually sell to their existing book of clients. So they can make a lot more money by acquiring competitors versus someone that is just creating a software business from day one. They count on recurring revenue. And of course, it is one business that has been able to surf on the cloud uh, over the past decade and now surfing on the rise of AI. So they are already integrating AI on their on their business model and in their software, which makes life of their customers so easy. Uh, I, I was I was talking with with my daughter the other day, and she was like, "Wow, that's amazing!" She was using Notion, and just to show you how it could be fast, she was like, oh, "I'm trying to get like a calendar app to to like manage this and that and that," and she just asked Notion AI to do it for her. And and the 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 thing that is incredible about that is. The more people use 
AI for a specific software, the more that software becomes like very, very intelligent because it would be like for Salesforce, it would be like having like 500 companies asking questions, making like requirements from their AI services. And then that AI gets all those, those information. So it's like just always asking the same assistant serving like 500 companies. So that assistant would be like so knowledgeable and powerful. That would be crazy. Mm -hmm. Well, this is what they're creating right now. So it's creating kind of like another level of a moat because of their network effect, having so many clients across so many different industries. And, and that, will become an even more, even stickier business going forward. Mm -hmm. And Mike, I just want to bring like some uh, emphasis on, on what you said about Meta and the ecosystem that they're trying to build. Because at one point I was afraid that Meta, you know, like young people are not necessarily that much on Facebook and Instagram. They use other, other apps and all that. And some older people just don't want to get on board, but I have like the, the perfect example at home because my um, my uh, oldest son, who is now 13, he doesn't like Facebook. He uses Snap. But then <laughs> when he wants to keep in touch with like his aunts, uh, his grandmothers, <laughs> you know, old folks like us, well, he uses Messenger. So he doesn't like, it's all linked. So he doesn't have the choice. He has to be on Facebook. And same goes for my husband, like you've mentioned. He's, he's not a fan of, uh, of Facebook at all, but he uses Marketplace a lot and also Messenger. So I think that the fact that they created this is, ecosystem is very smart and uh, allows them to keep on growing. So <laughs> listeners, I hope you enjoyed the episode so far, but I have to interrupt it a minute. Our goal at Dividend Stocks Rock is, is to help you invest with more conviction. We know that dividend income is important for you, and this is why we have gathered all you need to know about it in the Dividend Income for Life guide. Right, Mike? Yes, uh, I have a completely different approach when it comes down to generate dividend income. And I wanted to share my view with that. I wrote a series of DSR fundamental newsletters that were greatly appreciated by our members this year. I received tons of comments. And a lot of them were... Mike, you just came out with some very thought provocative context, uh, concepts. And, and at this point, I really want to change my portfolio and follow this path to a better type of dividend income. So I've did a great review of those DSR fundamentals newsletters, packaged them together, wrote a few more pages of content and built that dividend income for life. This guide, as you said, has been highly rated by our DSR members and we share it for free with you today. To grab your copy, hit pause on your app, visit thedividendguyblog.com slash income and enter your name and email. You'll then receive the email with your download. And also, by the way, it's always a pleasure to hear from you. So please let us know how it helped you. Again, thedividendguyblog.com slash income. Uh, Mike, now what would be the potential risks for investors if they bought shares of these companies? And I'm tempted to add, is there a possibility of no dividend growth? Um, I'll answer the question about dividend growth first, because that would be the answer, the same answer for the three companies. If they don't increase their dividend, that would be by a choice for capital allocation and not mm -hmm. because they cannot afford it. So it's really different uh, between a struggling business and a business that just decides that they found more ways to use their cash flow. And again, to continue with the example of Constellation Software, this is exactly what they're doing. They need their cash flow to make tons of acquisitions every year. So they have no room to distribute additional cash flow to shareholders because they're just telling their shareholders, dude, we are creating more value by reinvesting in the business. So maybe it is a possibility. I don't think so, especially because they just started paying a dividend. So I'm expecting a dividend increase every year, but mm -hmm. they don't do it. That will be more about a capital allocation decision than anything else. 
Now for the risks, because unfortunately nothing is perfect. And and you highlighted one for, for Meta that is a major one, competitors. Uh, like all the young people are, as you mentioned, on Snap, on, on TikTok, on other platforms, mm -hmm. FBs getting old. And, and that has been a source of concern going forward. So this is also the reason why they invest so much into other apps and other services. The problem with this is when you invest a lot, well, sometimes you don't make that much money. I mean, I'm not too sure, but we haven't heard too much about what's going on in the metaverse. I don't know if like they... <laughs> they I don't know if the customs decided not to let us like go on the other side and visit the metaverse, but uh, it, that that has slowed down big time. So maybe it's mm -hmm. going to make a comeback. I'm I'm not going to say it's not going to exist or anything else, but just want to mention that sometimes when those companies are investing massively in projects, it's not always working. So that could be a big risk for them. So just to destroy cash flow in the hope of trying to beat the competitions because before they used to just buy everybody and and that worked for a while but now they they also got what was coming from the, for them is regulators they're just like yeah we do not want you to do another instagram buyout because that was just like yeah let's take a look at who is the competitor here let's buy him out and there you go end of the story well mm -hmm. now it's going to be a little bit harder going forward and Whatever happens with regulators, it's one thing that's like a source of uncertainties, but in the meantime, it creates a lot of distraction. So it will increase market volatility. It will distract management from operating their business because they also have to deal with regulators answering their questions. And and we we saw like that episode about i don't know like 20 years ago maybe 15 years ago can't remember but with microsoft they went into a epic battle against regulators now it's pretty much a time of for meta and alphabet to have that kind of like uh, weekly meetings <laughs> with the dojs <laughs> and, the, and others not truly really appreciated but that's they're pretty much stuck with this uh mm -hmm. moving on to alphabet of course the antitrust challenges that happened this uh well that, that started this summer and keeps on going will have a similar impact we don't know what will be the end of this maybe they're like it's going to be like a major impact on the business maybe not usually those big guys are they have enough lawyers that they can get away from most of it but it will still be a big source of distraction the other problem i see for google is their heavy concentration on advertising so similar mm -hmm. uh, story than for meta it, it forces them to spend massively elsewhere. But when you spend massively elsewhere, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to work out. So you're kind of like stuck to try to push the business to another level by creating new products and new services. You don't know how many Google Clouds you're going to generate and how many... Um, metaverse is going to happen so uh <laughs> it's it's not always a winning situation so we'll see how it goes going forward another concern i have for google will be um artificial intelligence because i see this as a amazing opportunity and an amazing threat at the same time. So will Google will be able to benefit from AI to enhance its business, enhance its search engine, and strengthen its position um, in the industry? Or AI will be used by competitors to take search engines searches away from them and therefore a lot of advertising revenue so we don't know exactly how it's going to happen uh i mean i'm not a big fan of like google because running an online business and i know like a lot of of uh, entrepreneur <laughs> online entrepreneur, entrepreneurs can can relate on that whenever there's a google update you're always like panicking because you don't know if you're going to lose like half of your search engine traffic overnight so of course a lot of us are trying to find alternatives uh, with not necessarily great success, but just to see that whenever there's uh, people that are not super happy with your business model, there is a breach where um, AI could be a great tool for competitors to try to offer another solution. So again, mm -hmm. innovation, when it's, when it's time to, to look at technology business related businesses is always a big point of uncertainty. Uh, finally, for Salesforce, uh, the big question is, 
how long and how fast it can continue to grow. Uh, I made the parallel with Open Text, which is a much smaller business on the Keen side, but they operate in the same industry. And the biggest problem for Open Text is they used to grow by acquisition big time. They were a darling of the TSX. And at one point, that story slowed down and they struggled to find organic growth. So right now, none of those are a problem for Salesforce, but they will be forced to keep on bringing the numbers on the table. So that could lead to more aggressive acquisitions in terms of like uh, not paying the right price, getting like in a bidding war against other competitors that would like to make the same acquisition. And the more acquisition you make, the higher the integration risk there is. So sometimes you mm -hmm. just make a big failure of integrating your business and then you just spent way too much time and way too much money into the bad and the, the like the worst investment you could do uh again competitors new technology is always around the corner so that will have like two consequences the first one salesforce will have to determine if they have to fight the business or if they have to buy it out so again pushing salesforce uh budget envelope for acquisition a bit uh, one one more notch above so mike all that said what's next i mean do you believe it's a new era of dividend payers and how do you foresee the future of these businesses and their sectors uh i mean What's exciting about dividend growth investing or the market in general is there's never a dull moment, right? There's always something moving. There's always something changing. Um, and I just love to see new companies coming in. Uh, don't ex don't be overhyped on the other side because, of course, mm -hmm. dividend initiators will come with a sexy story and a thriving business model. So... Maybe it's a little bit little too late as well. You never know. So you have to make sure that you take the time to review those business model, model carefully, looking into them to make sure that they fit within your um, within your, your sector allocation, your portfolio. Keep in mind that Meta and Alphabet, even though they're classified under the communication sector, their entire business models revolves around their technology. So yes, mm -hmm. they are making advertising revenue, but in the end, this is why they are, and they, they are producing entertainment. So this is why they are uh, classified as communication sector. But in the end, if they, they fail on the technology side, they're really going to fail all over it. Uh, for Salesforce, it's a little bit different because they have been able to use AI and they're like really a pure technology company, software business. So that's not a problem. They all have strong moats and multiple successful flywheels. Believe it or not, that was very hard for me to say. Um, and yes, I'm very excited, excited to see those companies and monitor them going forward. Mm -hmm. I don't think necessarily that we're going to see like a bunch of new companies. Maybe Amazon will be the next one looking mm -hmm. for it uh i do have a small position in it so i would be interested <laughs> to see that coming in um but yeah i mean it's it's never a dull moment in the market okay so last question for today would you add meta google or salesforce to your buy list and why uh i would be tempted to add google uh because it has a similar business model to apple and microsoft in a sense where they're generating a ton of cash flow from their core business and they are exploring growth avenues and they have successfully done so with other segments such as the cloud so i think mm -hmm. it could be very very interesting to to, to follow this one um, i am intrigued by salesforce uh i really want to see what's coming going to come up next in terms of like are they able to maintain such level of growth moving forward or if they're going to slow down so that is the big question i have for them and i really need more time for meta uh i just can't get my head around this one but but i i wanted to highlight the fact that it's important to invest in companies that you not only understand but that you believe in i'm not a big fan and big user of Facebook altogether. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not too sure I get this whole social media hype. So for those reasons, I'm less interested in the company. I'm less confident. I'm not saying it's a bad investment. It's really about 
personal perceptions. But when you're about to add a position to your portfolio, that is crucial. If you're not fully comfortable and confident that this business model is going to work moving forwards, there's no point of going after this one. And maybe I'm missing out on a huge opportunity here. And that's all good because there are too many opportunities anyways for my brain to process. So I'm better off <laughs> working on the one that I like the most. And maybe eventually I'm going to change my mind about Meta. But at this point, I'm just going to look at it and see how it goes uh, from the sideline. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Mike, for sharing your view on these new dividend payers. I had like great expectations for this episode and you didn't disappoint me. So... <laughs> Congrats. Listeners, learn how to create a sustainable dividend income at retirement by downloading your free copy of the Dividend Income for Life guide at thedividendguyblog.com slash income. For the show notes and related content, visit thedividendguyblog.com slash 192. Next week, we will exchange chairs and Mike will interview me. So Ooh. hit the subscribe button not to miss it. Until then, stay, stay invested. invested. Hey, fellow investors, it's Mike here. I hope that you have enjoyed this episode. Please note that the Dividend Guy blog podcast is at no time issuing buy or sell recommendation. Please do your own due diligence as this podcast is recorded for information and hopefully fun purposes only. Uh, make your research. Make sure you do your stuff. We're not responsible for your losses or your profit after listening this episode. And until next one, stay invested.